as we have discussed on previous occasions, the single greatest virtue that anybody can have, at least in the minds of a lot of our society today, is that of being tolerant, um, having an open mind, uh, being accepting of, of not only different uh, races and, and cultures and, and religions and so forth, but uh, behaviors even uh, being being accepting of, of whatever lifestyle that, that people might uh, want to lead uh, if you just are completely non-judgmental in any way well then you are clearly uh, morally superior uh, to to those who would uh, deign to pass uh, any kind of a, a judgment uh, you know Christians have a bad reputation sometimes we get a get a bad rap uh, at being viewed as those who are, are narrow-minded uh, you know the just as Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 14 tell us there's a narrow way that leads to life and the, and the gospel being a, a exclusive the exclusive nature of it uh, sometimes uh, when we hold to that we're viewed as narrow-minded or uh, because we will not accept sinful behavior as, as something that is acceptable then we're viewed as as intolerant or, or judgmental, but tonight we want to notice that Christians are indeed broad-minded. Uh, when you look at the, the, the definition, broad-minded from dictionary.com, it says it's free from prejudice or bigotry, unbiased, liberal, and tolerant. And we're going to see tonight as we go through this lesson that the definition fits uh, Christians. First of all, we'll notice we're broad-minded enough to obey all of God's will. To teach and, and believe that it is our obligation and, and duty to obey all of God's will. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and verses 12 and 13, as he concluded his, his musings there, as he considered uh, what, what life meant. Uh, vanity and vexation of the spirit is, is what he determined that uh, this life was without God. And he said in, in Ecclesiastes 12, verses 12 and 13, Further, my son, be admonished by these, of making many books there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Uh, another version says that it is the, the whole duty of man to fear God and to keep his commandments. And as Christians, that is absolutely what we must believe and what we must practice. In Matthew chapter 28. And verses 18 through 20, when Jesus gave uh, the great commission to his apostles before his ascension, it says, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. There are a few things as you go through this. What, what Jesus says here that, that people um, don't follow nowadays. And the first one is when it says baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, many who name the name of Christ, or at least nominally uh, do, uh, don't believe that baptism is necessary uh, for salvation. Jesus says you make disciples by baptizing. Um, and then the second part of that, that, that people don't really adhere to so much these days is the observe all things that I've commanded you. That's the other part of that. You you share the gospel, you baptize and make disciples, and then you teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. That's what being a Christian is all about. It's about learning what Jesus wants from us and then doing it. If you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. John chapter 8 and verse 31. That's the definition of a, of a, of a disciple of Christ. And, and disciples are Christians. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. We are to observe all of God's will. Now, that, that should be our goal. Obviously, um, as men, we fall short. We fall short, and that's where the grace of God comes in. Because we have the blood of Jesus to wash away those sins when we, when we do fall short. Our, our aim is to observe all things that we have been commanded. Uh, we're often accused of being pharisaical. We've talked about this over the last couple of months once or twice 
But the idea that uh, when you teach someone to keep all of God's word, that somehow that makes you a bad Christian. You're not the kind of person that Jesus would have you to be. But notice what Jesus says to the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, beginning in verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Worried about little things, completely ignoring the big things. And Jesus says that not only should you do the little things, but you should do the big things too. You do both of them. You do the big things and you do the little things. Observe all things that I have commanded you. We're broad-minded enough to believe that we ought to obey all of God's will. We are also broad-minded enough as, as disciples of Jesus Christ to emphasize the whole truth. In Acts chapter 20, in verses 26 and 27, Paul, in speaking to the elders in Ephesus there, uh, saying farewell to them, he says, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Why, Paul? Why are you innocent? He says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. The whole truth, but nothing but the truth. Paul had shared that with those in Ephesus. And he did that everywhere. He taught the same things in every church. You see, First uh, Timothy chapter, or rather, First Corinthians chapter four and verse seventeen. He taught the same things everywhere. He shared the whole truth wherever he went. I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God, and therefore he was innocent of the blood of all men. We need to emphasize the whole truth. You know, John wrote in Revelation twenty-two, verses eighteen and nineteen. He said, "For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book: If anyone adds to these things," God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away from his part, to take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. We're not to take away from God's word, and we're not to add to God's word, we're to take God's word. And the context here, this is specifically having to do with the words of the prophecy there in Revelation, but it's a principle that is found throughout the word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. Moses told the Israelites don't add to and don't take away from the law so that you can keep it. Proverbs 30 and verse 5. Don't add to the Lord's words lest you be found a liar. You don't change the word of God. You emphasize the whole truth, all of it. Don't take away from it. Don't, don't add to it. The scriptures provide everything that is necessary for us to, to be fully equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 17. The scriptures contain all things that pertain to life and godliness. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. So if you add to that, you, you have too much. And if you take away from it, you, you don't have it all. Emphasize the whole truth. And so uh, as we consider some of the things that get taught and, and what passes for Christianity today, we see that, that uh, the whole truth is not emphasized. Those that take verses that say that faith is necessary for salvation and, and then uh, ignore the rest of the verses that talk about how it is that we ought to live in order to uh, obtain uh, the righteousness that is through faith. We have to be not only uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But if you turn over there to John chapter 3. Get there eventually. John, the third chapter, <clears throat> verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he is not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 21, he who does the truth comes to light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Verse 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's the New King James Version. You know what other versions say there? Those who don't obey the Son will not have everlasting life. It's obedience. What is this found in? The passage is found in the context of Jesus saying you have to be baptized in order to enter the kingdom. You have to be born of water and the Spirit. Follow the Spirit's instructions to be baptized in water in order to enter the kingdom. 
It's about obedience. <coughs> we have to not only have believe, but we have to do. We have to emphasize the whole truth when it comes to the, the security of the believer. Once saved, always saved is not true. We cannot live in, in any old way once we become a Christian and expect to go to heaven. We have to be faithful to God. We have to actually obey his commandments. We can have that evil heart of unbelief, Hebrews 3.12. We can fall from grace, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. We can be like dogs returning to the, their vomit or sows having been washed to their wallowing in the mire, 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 20 through 22 teach us. We have to be faithful. We have to maintain our confidence steadfast in the end, Hebrews chapter 3 and Hebrews chapter 4. Both contain verses that say that. We have to emphasize the whole truth when it comes to worship. Worship is not something that's left up to our conscience to be done according to what our conscience dictates unless our conscience is trained by God's word because we must worship in spirit and in truth, John chapter 4 and verse 24. We have to follow the pattern for the church when it comes to the work that the church does, the way that the church is organized. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me. Faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul told Timothy. Follow that pattern when it comes to the church. And the idea that salvation can be found anywhere outside of Christ. You know, I was uh, going to Walmart uh, yesterday to get some supplies that I needed to finish a little project I was working on. And I heard, a, as I was pulling in the parking lot, I heard a commercial from a, a Catholic muckety muck from Dallas some of the Catholic diocese in Dallas uh, and it was a, a commercial talking about whether you celebrate Easter or Ramadan or Passover uh, just all people of goodwill let's come together and I thought and, and this is what people view as Christianity today you know it's okay if you want to be a Muslim and, and and celebrate Ramadan. And it's okay if you want to deny Jesus and be a Jew today and celebrate Passover like in the law of Moses. That guy has some authority in the Catholic Church in Dallas, and that's the Catholic Church paid to put that on the radio. The very idea. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. You cannot be saved outside of Christ. We need to emphasize that truth. It doesn't make us intolerant. We are broad-minded enough as, as Christians to respect all persons. James chapter 2. Turn with me to James the second chapter. James chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit here at my footstool, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Showing partiality to rich people over poor people. We don't do that. As Christians, we're commanded not to do that. God has chosen the poor of this world, we're told. So we're not, we don't show partiality in that regard. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. It doesn't matter what race you are. Acts chapter 17 teaches us that of one blood, God has made us all. Of one blood, there is no uh, there should be no prejudice based upon uh, what color our skin is or where we're from because we're all from the same blood. And God shows no partiality. Whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. And we are respectful of enough of people to teach everybody 
that they have to repent of their sins. We do not have that bigotry of low, the, what do they call the soft bigotry of low expectations. We do not practice that. We respect everybody. And we de demand, just like the scriptures do, that everybody has to repent and live a life that is right in the sight of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Paul says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous, you, that is not limited to any particular race or gender or nationality. Unrighteous, whoever you are, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Everybody, all men, are sinners. All of sin come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. All men are sinners. All men must repent. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. We are broad-minded enough as Christians to investigate before passing judgment. We will pass judgment, but only after we have considered and investigated. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21. Paul said, test all things, hold fast what is good. John writes in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. We read Luke's account of Paul's second missionary journey, Acts chapter 17, verse 11. These were more fair-minded, speaking of the Bereans, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. If we hear something, we investigate it in the light of God's word. If it's somebody bringing teaching, we're going to compare that to what the scriptures say. We're going to judge righteously. Nicodemus said in John chapter 7 and verse 51, as the, the Pharisees, the chief priests and the Pharisees wanted to pass judgment on Jesus, he says, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? And it was not supposed to. Jesus taught earlier in that chapter, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. You know, judge not that you be not judged. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1, people know two scriptures. God so loved the world, John 3, 16, and judge not that you be not judged. Everybody knows those two. Of course, they don't know what's on either side of those two, and so they can't properly uh, give you the meaning of those passages. But judge not that you be not judged, that speaks of hypocritical judgment. He says, pull the plank out of your eye so that you can see the speck in your brother's eye so that you can help him. And don't try to judge your brother when you've got a plank in your eye and he, all he's got is a speck. Jesus taught, don't be a hypocrite in Matthew chapter 7. And that's why he says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. That's what we do as Christians. And we don't just limit that judgment to what to others. We practice self-examination. We look at our own lives. Just as Jesus commanded, James writes in James chapter 1 and verse 22, but be doers of the word. He said, receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls earlier. He says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. We look into the perfect law of liberty and continue in it. We see the glory of God in his word. And we are transformed into that image by the spirit as we mold our lives according to this word. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. We're transformed by the renewing of our minds. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. 
But we have to look into the perfect law of liberty and continue in it. We have to examine ourselves to see whether we're in the faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Test yourselves, Paul said. What does God's word say? Where does my life stand in relation to that word? Am I submitting to God and his commandments or am I being self-willed? Am I falling short? Romans chapter 2 and verses 1 through 3. Paul said as he, he's already he has just convicted Gentiles of being guilty of sin and he begins on the Jews. In chapter 2 and verse 1, therefore, therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself, or you who judge practice the same things. Jews that were guilty of sin were guilty of sin, just like Gentiles. You judge the Gentiles because of their sinful behavior, but you do those very things, and you're guilty too, Paul says. Verse 2, but we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? This hypocrisy will not work. God is not mocked. But whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. If we sow to the flesh, will of the flesh reap corruption. If we sow to the spirit, will of the spirit reap everlasting life. But God is not mocked. We can't fool him putting on some act, you know, darkening the doors of a church building once a week or so and, and, and then living our lives the rest of the time as if we weren't owned, bought, and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. God sees that. He knows our hearts. He knows our motivations. The thoughts and intents of the heart are naked and open. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 tells us, The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it discerns even the thoughts and intents of the heart. We practice self-examination. We're broad-minded enough to be able to do that, and we are broad-minded enough to fellowship those who walk in the light. Everybody who walks in the light will have fellowship with them, which is what the Scriptures teach us. You know, today it's this ecumen ecumenical nature of, of what passes for Christianity. We just, it's unity and diversity. It's you set aside your differences and and you just forget whatever it is that the Bible teaches. And, and just, if you can only agree that Jesus is God's son, then you can set aside all these other things and everything's all right. But is that what the scriptures teach? No, it is not. First John chapter 1 and verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light, that light is the truth of God's word. And so we don't have fellowship with those who are living in sin. We don't share fellowship with them. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, Paul says, For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Shameful even to speak of those things. We're to expose those things, Paul says in that same context. People that live and practice sin, that's their practice. We don't have fellowship with them. We're, we do what 1 Corinthians chapter 5 teaches us. You put that person out of your midst, that one who was engaged in fornication with his father's wife. Paul says you don't have anything to do with somebody who's living like that, and it's to encourage them to repent. And so we don't. And so that's what we practice. But we fellowship everybody who's walking in the line. But we don't fellowship those who are teaching false doctrine. 2 John verses 9 through 11. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. You cannot have fellowship with someone teaching false doctrine. False doctrine will cost people their souls. If anyone wanders from the truth... And, when, and you turn him back, you save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins, James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20 teaches. You save a soul from death when you turn someone back to the truth who's wandered from them. The truth shall make you free, John 8, 32, not the lies of false teachers. 
What does the word of God say? If any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11. Those are the ones we have fellowship with. Those who speak as the oracles of God. Those who walk in the light as he is in the light. We're broad-minded enough to fellowship all those ones. There are limits. There are limits to how broad-minded we can be because we cannot change what the Word of God teaches. We must obey all of God's will. We must emphasize the whole truth. We must respect all people equally. We have to investigate before passing judgment, practice self-examination, and fellowship all those who walk in the line. And that's our lesson for this evening. If you're here tonight and you've never obeyed the gospel, I encourage you to do that because God loves you. God doesn't want anyone to perish. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's will. He wants everybody to come to repentance, and the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. God's grace has appeared to all men. Everyone has the same access to that grace through Jesus Christ, his Son. Believe in it. That he is God's Son and that God raised him from the dead. Repent of your sins, which means change your mind and change your mind. <coughs> Confess him before men. Be baptized in water in obedience to his command that you might be saved, that you might access the blood that was shed to wash away your sins. You've never done it, do it this evening. And if you're here and you're a child of God and your life has not been in keeping with His will, if you've not maintained your confidence steadfast, then repent. As long as you're alive, there's opportunity to re repent. Do that this evening if you need to, while you have the chance. Whatever your need might be, won't you come forward and make it known while together we stand and sing.